Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America and the Blue Funk Broadcasting Radio Network. Great to have you with us on the program. As mentioned in the beginning, David Stevens, our guest on the program, Resurrect is his new book. It's been optioned for a movie. We'll be talking about that aspect of it as well in the program today. Uh, Dave, first of all, welcome to This Week in America. So many interesting things to talk about because I'm reading this thinking, boy, that's a little scary. I'm glad that couldn't happen in real life. And then I'm finding out maybe that could happen in real life. Welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Thank you for having me on it. I really appreciate it. Now, I understand what you're talking about in the book. And well, let me just sort of quickly lay the uh, the groundwork here. Preventing his burning fighter from crashing into a neighborhood, Navy Commander Josh Logan ejects too late, critically injured. He's offered a new life and mission. Exploit highly classified military technology to stop a global uh, cataclysm. The price? He'll be dead to everyone he knows. And actually, what you're writing about in the book, and we're talking a lot about threats here, uh, could actually happen in real life? You know, the, everybody's kind of freaked out about the Mayans. Uh, you know, they ran out of rock. Uh, the world <laughs> is not going to end December 21st. And, and if it if I'm wrong and it does, I'll be glad to make a public apology. <laughs> um, but the, the, the fact is there are some very serious threats facing us. And uh, it's not the Mayan calendar. And what I, I did is I, I thought, uh, since my, my career had been predominantly one of destruction, um, you know, a, a fighter pilot, uh, nuclear weapons uh, qualified. Um, I was a strike operations uh, planner during a desert storm, worked on classified defense programs. I thought, you know, what if I could apply some of that destructive expertise actually to, to protect and save? Well, that's interesting. And I mentioned that we talk a lot about threats. And let's talk about that going back to your younger days as a pilot. And you talk about uh, we're all bulletproof when we're young. We think nothing is going to happen to us. And you had sort of a, a slap of reality with a, uh, with a friend of yours who also was a pilot. I did. Um, yeah, you, you know, I had some close brushes, especially around the aircraft carrier. But, but yeah, like you said, we're, we're immortal. We're fearless. And then a few years into the fleet, I had a, a, a very close friend of mine. He was a roommate, and he died in a crash. And uh, that's when I suddenly realized I'm not immortal. But it had a different impact on me. I, I started thinking, you know, none of us really believe in our own death until we have a brush with it or, or know somebody who close uh, who that happens to. But, but I think that applies to societies. Um, we don't, we turn a blind eye towards some p- potentially serious, maybe even apocalyptic threats because we're, it, it's too far away. Nobody's experienced it. So I thought, you know, this might be an opportunity to try to, to try to use fiction to, because uh, in the, in the, uh, papers I read for, uh, I researched for all of this, uh, frankly, a third of it is equations and statistics. So I thought, wouldn't it be great if you could capture that and make it personal for people, for, for the public? Well, and it's a real thriller. It's got excellent reviews. The book is Resurrect. David E. Stevens is our guest on the program. Uh, it's an award-winning book, award-winning science fiction thriller. It's been optioned for a motion picture. Let's talk about that in the beginning. That has to be exciting for you. And as I'm reading the book, I'm actually seeing it in, in, in my mind as a movie. I can't wait for the movie to come out. This is actually going to be a, a big screen thriller here at some point. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love to hear that, that, that you can picture it in your head. Um, it was optioned by producer Fred Miller. Uh, he's got uh, Academy Award nominations for some of his movies in the past. Um, they're about to release, I think, probably a, a 2013 Christmas release in North America. I, I'm, it may be releasing overseas as well, but a movie called When Angels Sing, starring Harry Connick Jr. I've seen the trailer. It's awesome. Uh, so I'm very excited to have somebody with, with his his uh, capability, his artistic creativity working on this um, the, yeah, webs- the website for David, by the way, is resurrecttrilogy.com. The book is available at the website, available all across the country. Of course, Amazon, our website, thisweekinamerica.us. We'll have a link on there as well. And there's more good news because, as I just alluded to, it's a trilogy. Uh, stand by for uh, parts two and three. We're going to stick with one and talking about threats here. And actually, as we're reading these threats, and I, I really found this out later, that you and you mentioned before the the research that you've done. I mean, you really looked into this, and everything you're talking about there, th- there is a probability that this could actually happen. Unfortunately, there is. Um, what I use is something called probabilistic risk analysis, which is the same science your insurance company uses to set your insurance rates. It just looks at, at at probability and consequences, and when you multiply those two together, things that have significant chance of happening with uh, the consequence, in this case, uh, potentially the end of the human race or at least civilization. I shouldn't laugh about that. It's not funny. But um, you realize that uh, there are only a handful of things that could probably seriously take us out. And I I ended up narrowing it down to about three, which 
ended up being the uh, the basis for the trilogy. Well, let's talk about that, and we'll sort of take them in lowest threat first. You've got nuclear uh, or biological. Talk a little bit about that threat. That's probably what was surprising is that it came out number three. Yes. Um, yes. The, with the end of the Cold War, the chance of a global nuclear war has, has definitely shrunk, although Scientific American estimates that there's a 50-50 probability of a nuclear weapon being discharged by potentially a rogue nation. So the chance of, an, of a nuclear uh, weapon going off is higher, but but a nuclear war is smaller. However, there's still, even with drawdowns, there's still enough warheads out there to, to, to take out about a billion uh, people directly and maybe a couple billion people through starvation, nuclear winter, etc. Well, that's staggering when you see those statistics. And I guess a lot of these what came at the end of the Cold War and they're unaccounted for when the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. There's still a lot of warheads out there that uh, would they still be able to use these? Would they still be uh, potent? Unfortunately, yes. Um, without going into too much detail, because I was qualified to carry them, these things tend to last a long time. Wow. Um, they do have to be maintained. That's correct. And we are drawing them down, which is great. Talking about the book Resurrect, everything we're talking about is uh, is in the book. It's a, it's a science fiction thriller, but it's all based on reality. And it's a real eye-opener as we're reading. Uh, and it's not just like a textbook and you're sitting down. This is like a real thriller. Once you start the book, I don't know how many people I talked to that, like, once I got started, I was going to maybe read for an hour. And three hours later, I'm still going through the book. We're talking about some of the uh, some of the threats to us out there. We're talking about nuclear, biological uh, number two is artificial intelligence. Explain that. And that's probably the most controversial. And, and I know a lot of people look at that and they're thinking Terminator. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, we don't know if, if, uh, if there'll be uh, computers will become aware or conscious, but we do know, and it's not rocket scientists. You can predict the growth of, of computational power very, very easily. It's something called Moore's law. It's been deadly accurate since the 1960s, about every two years, processing power and memory double. Um, we see it in, uh, in concrete ways in those uh, on our cell phones, our smartphones. I mean, if you've got a smartphone that's over two years old, it's obsolete. So we we actually see that happening. Now, it doesn't take, like I said, a rocket scientist to draw that line out and see that by about uh, 2020, 2025, 2030, um, things are going to start picking up. Basically, 25 to 30 years from now, we should have processors that have the same computational power as the human brain. Uh, but there is a there is a wild card. That is really frightening. Are we are we getting ahead of ourselves with technology? I think I think some of it is inevitable, but we need to start thinking about it because, um, you know, you think, well, we got 20, 25 years and that's probably correct for for standalone computers. But that crazy smartphone that's sitting in your palm has a, a IQ equivalent of about a lizard, which I know isn't very impressive. But think about this for a minute. There will soon be billions of these smartphones around the world. They're all connected. They're becoming more connected, just like the neurons in a human brain. If you put all that processing power together, I mean, there's nothing that will connect them that way so far. But if you put that processing power together, it would have far greater computational power than the human brain. Dave Stevens is our guest on the program, retired AE, AEDC Navy commander, award-winning science fiction thrillers, his book, Resurrect. He knows what he's talking about here. He's got engineering degrees from Cornell, the University of Michigan, graduate work in human factors and astrophysics. So this is all this is all second nature to you. So you were able to use some of the background and, and put in the book. And the book is, as I say, is a real page turner. Resurrect. It's available all across the country. The website resurrecttrilogy.com. Mentioned some of the threats that you uh, discussed. We were doing the top three. We were counting them down. Three, two, one, which would be probably a surprise to people. Comet impact. Absolutely. And the trouble here is you get a little bit of the giggle factor that you think, well, you know, that's a great uh, plot for a, a science fiction. But really, in fact, it's a great plot because it is a threat. And, and that's actually increased over the last five to 10 years with recent research. Uh, there's an organization called the B612 Foundation, a gentleman named Dr. Ed Liu, former astronaut, is the CEO, a great guy. What he did is, is he stepped outside of, of the government and said, you know, we're not doing enough about this. 1%, only 1% of the Earth orbit crossing asteroids have been found. Now, we may have found a lot of the big ones, but it doesn't take more than a, I mean, uh, an asteroid the size of a football field uh, would be over 10 megatons. That's bigger than any nuclear weapon I ever carried. That would take out an entire city and metropolitan center. And that's not the only threat. You met, mentioned comets, which are even a higher probability. How do we protect ourselves? And actually, you talk about that, the uh, basically three Ps that we can do to uh, to protect ourselves. 
what can we do? What should we be thinking about? Because as you describe these and as we read them in the book, these are real threats that we really need to take seriously. Yes, there, there are things we can do. In fact, uh, that really is, was what the, the trilogy is all about. You know, how do, how do we fix this problem? How do we attack it? Of course, first you have to know your enemy. Um, I mentioned uh, Ed Liu and the B612 Foundation. One of the things that they want to do, which is brilliant, is put up a, a small infrared telescope about somewhere near the orbit of Venus. And the whole idea there is they believe within a matter of years they can map all of the uh, Earth orbit crossing asteroids, or at least the vast majority of them. So that is a, a something in place to actually fix the problem. Comets are a little bit tougher. Comets exist out in uh, out past the solar system, what they call the Oort cloud. Uh, there are probably around two million asteroids, but there are hundreds of billions of comets. The problem with comets, and the reason why they've recently become a, a, a concern, astronomers for a long time have, have, have thought, you know, there should be thousands more out there than we're, we're seeing. So where are they? Well, uh, recent research, especially by a gentleman named uh, Dr. Bill Napier of the UK, he's a, a leading impact astrophysicist. And what he said is, if you think about a, a comet, it's a, it's a dirty snowball. I mean, that's how they usually describe them, right. rock and debris and, and gunk and ice. But every time it goes around the sun, it burns off a lot of that ice. So what are you left with? Turns out most of the gunk, especially on the surface, that stuff is so non-reflective that they believe a lot of uh, these comets have the surface reflectivity of fresh asphalt. And and you go, well, that's theory. But there was a, a comet called Aras Araki Alcock. It uh, was 1980s, came within about uh, 3 million miles of the Earth, which is very close in astronomical terms. Um, it was five miles wide. We didn't see it until it was at its closest approach two weeks out. Uh, a comet that size um, would have been uh, thousands of uh, megatons. We're talking uh, having a nuclear war um, once a day for 20 years. Wow. Uh, that, that's the kind of power we're talking about. So we have to put in some uh, some telescopes, if you will, to find those as well. So the first step is finding them. Then we have to figure out what we're going to do with them. It's fascinating, and we're rapidly running out of time, as I knew was going to be happening. That's why we'll have Dave back on the program. The book is Resurrect. It's the first of a trilogy. It's available all across the country. Name, very simple, Resurrect. Uh, Dave's website, resurrecttrilogy.com. It's an award-winning science fiction thriller, and everything in the book is based on And I want to talk about that because the Resurrection, uh, Resurrect Trilogy looks at some fascinating intersections between physics and religion from a science perspective that had to be interesting for you to go in and to be able to lay that out, but also challenging because you want to try to get this correct. So, you know, they, you've got the authenticity there as you're writing this. Absolutely. And and for those who want more referenced information, you know, people like me, engineers who want to have see the background on the website, we also have the science papers that, that a lot of this came from. Yeah, I'm looking at that and going, OK, this is way over my head. I'm not not I'm still trying to work my smartphone. I have no idea what all this means, <laughs> but it was all impressive. It all made it look like, OK, this this really is uh, uh, is very authentic and something that could actually happen. I got a couple minutes left here. When you're when you're looking at this, people talk about Big Bang. People talk about maybe actually finding a, a location for heaven. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on those topics? Uh, and and this is you know where you start going into this realm. Obviously, you want to be careful not to step on toes. But I, I couldn't help but notice, for example, that quantum physics, um, which is a bizarre science, um, suggests that you've got to have an observer. Uh, to set the state of a subatomic event. I mean, that, we've known this for, for decades and decades. It's held up forever. But but cosmology says the Big Bang started from a, a singularity, an infinitely tiny point, which means at the very beginning of the universe, it would have operated under the laws of quantum mechanics, which require an observer to start the or set the equation, right. set the, the state of events. Kind of an interesting thought that quantum mechanics may require an observer to start the universe. Is there a location for heaven that you could pinpoint? Now, now we're really getting out there, but uh, M3, <laughs> and I'm putting you out on the limb. Go ahead. No, no, it, it, this is fascinating. <laughs> I love to talk about this, but M theory, which is the the most current theory of uh, attempt at theory, explain everything. It, it ties together all the forces of nature, and it's done pretty well for the last decade. But it requires eleven equations, eleven excuse me, eleven dimensions to balance the equations. Well, if you take out the three of of space and time, or and, and one of time, you're left with seven missing dimensions, seven invis invisible dimensions. Well. You can't help but notice that all of the, the world's major religions, um, Christianity, uh, Judaism, Islam, either have seven heavens or seven levels of heaven or seven tied very specifically to heaven. 
fascinating coincidence, if nothing else. What if, what if quantum mechanics and uh, physics have, uh, have found uh, heaven in, that, in those missing dimensions? Just an interesting thought. Well, it certainly is, and we'll have Dave back to talk more about this. We're talking in the book, Threats That, uh, and it's interesting, I'm looking at some of the material here. Did you know that a 100-meter comet or asteroid would obliterate a city? Uh, did you know it could be stopped? And we've talked about both those on the program. So we're talking a 100-meter comet could actually wipe out a U.S. city. Absolutely. That's just uh, staggering. As you're reading the book, you're going to enjoy it and think, okay, these things could actually happen. We need to be uh, prepared for that. The book is Resurrect. David Stevens has been our guest on the program. His website is resurrecttrilogy.com. You can get information. The book is available all across the country. You can, of course, order it at the website, get all the information that Dave is talking about. Uh, you can go to Facebook, uh, resurrecttrilogy.com, and you'll be able to find some great information there. And Dave sometimes takes uh, some of the names of some of the people on Facebook, and we'll incorporate those in, in upcoming books. I understand the second is going to be Conceive. Is that the, the title you're working on at this point? Absolutely. Conceive and probably Darken for the third. Uh, how are you coming on those two? Uh, Conceive is just about done, and uh, Darken has been outlined and about half done. Uh, how do you uh, come up with something more? I, after Resurrect, I think your mind had been gone for a while. It's like, I got I to gotta relax here. You, you actually have more in you. Oh, these were planned out from, from the beginning. Uh, I, once I start writing, it's hard to stop. So maybe a fourth one coming out at some point? Quite possibly. Okay. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Uh, we'll have Dave back. Great show. Resurrect is the name of the book. It's available all across the country. Our website as well, uh, thisweekinamerica.us. You can link on and get all the information or go directly to Dave's website at resurrecttrilogy.com. You're listening to This Week in America on the Blue Funk Broadcasting Radio Network.